Welcome all to my talk on Heidegger on death in the Beiträge zur Philosophie and the contributions. Um, it's often assumed that Heidegger doesn't really think about death much after being in time, which is not entirely true. Death remains central, and there's profound reason for that, which perhaps becomes clear in this talk. Uh, before I begin, as always, the usual, uh, feel free to share the video, subscribe, and uh, leave a comment, and perhaps also, if you'd like, contribute to um, the channel um, by leaving some donation via PayPal or uh, support the channel on Patreon. Um, I'm also teaching a course on Heidegger on death, which starts end of June 2020, the seminars at least. So perhaps you're interested in that, just let me know. So before I begin, um, I'd like to say a few words about what death is in being in time and what it is that in the analytic of death as Dasein's own most possibility in being in time, what it is that Heidegger here comes across. What kind of an experience, which experience it is that he makes here in thought. So, first of all, very importantly, death is not to be taken as demise. This, the ontological phenomenon of death, Heidegger is after in being in time, is nothing to do with the measurable end of someone's life, with passing or dying in the ordinary sense of the word. Yet death, and this is the crux, is neither of merely metaphorical meaning, nor does death have anything to do with, nor does death have, sorry, nothing to do with mortality, as for example, a student of Hubert Dreyfus called William Blattner has claimed Blattner defines death in being in time, quite typical for an American scholar, as an episode of psychiatric depression. Apparently being in time is a guidebook for the psychiatrically depressed. I wasn't quite aware of this, but this is what Platner claims. Uh, because I think, you know, it makes being in time just something ready at hand, uh, an, an instrument, a tool with which one can operate in the world and read out some interesting aspects of life. So death, according to Platner, then is an episode of psychiatric depression. Um, it has nothing to do with mortality, he claims. In a paper from 2013, Ian Thompson, a, another student of Hubert Dreyfus, has attempted to synthesize claims that death is but a marker for global world collapse Dasein must experience with the fact that Heidegger does not appear at all, actually, to speak of death in purely metaphorical terms. This is where it gets difficult because here one would have to enter into thinking rather than staying on the mere level of representation, trying to hold on to some states that I can easily isolate one from the other. Here's the state of your psychiatric depression. Take that pill and you'll be happy again. And here's that state of authenticity. Once you reach that state, everything is fine and wonderful. But that's not how thinking thinks itself and how thinking occurs. By the way, just to mention this, Ian Thompson in this paper, which is published in the Cambridge Companion to Being in Time, and I've made this public in publications, um, and he's never gotten back to me. Um, to, he, Heidegger quotes in Being in Time, Jakob Böhme. Sorry, I was completely wrong. Heidegger quotes the Ackermann aus Böhmen, which is the farmer's man from Böhmen, which is a text written by Johannes Treppel, uh, which is a conversation between death and the farmer, and the farmer has just lost his wife and bemoans to death um, his loss. And then death says to the farmer, as soon as a man is born, he's old enough to die. That's the memento mori of this age. And Heidegger quotes this in Being in Time, because Being in Time is a memento mori, as all of Heidegger's thinking path can be thought of as learning how to die, which is what philosophy always is, is learning how to die. It's interesting that Thompson turns the Ackermann aus Böhmen into Jacob Böhme, who was a theosophist, uh, a mystic, a mystical thinker. Hegel is quite fond of Jakob Böhme. But you see, the Ackermann aus Böhmen, the farmer's man from Böhmen, is not Jakob Böhme, it's not Jacob Böhme, it's not this um, self-taught philosopher of <coughs> about 500 years ago. But Thompson then claims that 
the theology of Böhme, so-called, influences the theology of Kierkegaard, so-called theology, and that in theology influences Heidegger again. Um, it's very weird scholarship to make such a mistake. It's very strange. Um, but there are apparently no fact-checkers at Cambridge. Um, but uh, so it's... Maybe that gives an insight or just an indication into the level of reflexion that we're talking about here. Um, so anyways, for Thompson, death must, must actually have some sort of a meaning. Um, but let's see what he says. He says that being in time, death means global, a momentary global collapse of significance. Again, again, they're trying to, instead of think, they're trying to give a representational state that's concrete, that, I, that the understanding can hold on to. Right? So death, don't worry, death is just a global collapse of significance. Hmm? It's got, got nothing to do with the question of being, which is what the book is about. This is already just gone. Right? The question of death in Heidegger is so fundamental because it pulls us towards the question of being. Das Sein zum Tode, das Sein, being with death being itself with death. But anyway, so here we are. And the global collapse of significance, which apparently death is, because this, again, is a state that the understanding can easily hold on to, that representation can hold on to. And we each apparently have to live through such an episode of utter meaninglessness at will, it seems, in order to make peace with the fact that we demise at some point. So he's here importing some neat Epicureanism into Heidegger, which is absolutely not there. One must strongly disagree with such readings, not because of the rather strange scholarship, you know, the, con the conflation of the Ackermann aus Böhmen with the Jakob Böhme, but also with the fact that these readings deny thinking its place. Heidegger clearly says explicitly, quote, edification or rules of behavior towards death are not at all at stake in being in time. This is a quote, page 248 in the German, and page 230, sorry, 48 in the German, 238 in the Stambau translation. You will be able to read this. Not about edification. It's not about rules of behavior towards death. The book has as its theme the question of being, the Seinsfrage, the oldest question of philosophy, and not how I feel in a psychiatric depression, uh, depressive state, or anything like this whatsoever. This is not what the book is about. I cannot say this ever more forcefully, and it's devastating to read accounts like this. It really is because it's completely leading astray from the project and what is at stake in this book and in this thinking. So I have to be, uh, I have to say it, I think quite explicitly why such readings are so, um, well, dangerous. Yes, they are dangerous. So death and being in time is something else entirely. Death as the uttermost and almost limit of Dasein's existence is precisely the condition for world to arise, but is not the cause of world's collapse. In being in time, I would argue that we should rather understand death in such terms, that death is that which, by Dasein's being stretched out towards death, is what gives rise to world, where world is what? The horizon against which beings appear as meaningful. And we're already in a completely different way of thinking. It's now that without Dasein's being towards death, world would not arise. And this is why Heidegger and Davos, at the Davos Disputation, now infamous, Heidegger explicitly states that death of all phenomena is brought into play in being in time in order to disclose the horizon of the future. And I quote from Heidegger, the analytic of death has the function of bringing out the radical futurity of Dasein. Now again, the text is being and time. So if death has the function of bringing out the radical Zukunftigkeit, 
coming towardsness of Dasein, that which comes towards from that which has been, that it is death that pushes Dasein to the question of being, which means to radically turn back, repeat the question, so that a genuine future can arise. If you want to reduce this to a psychiatric depression or some sort of global collapse of meaning, whatever that's supposed to mean, then we are entirely outside the realm of this foundational text for philosophy. So, death is what gives Dasein orientation precisely because death co-constitutes the horizon of the future in concert with Dasein's thrownness and past Gewesenheit. Note also that Heidegger understands limit, Grenze, in the Greek sense of peras, and that is to say as the very boundary things to which something begins and where something begins, again, Representation wants us to believe that the boundary, the limit, is where something neatly ends. But imminently, the limit is where we always already are, and where something then is freed into its own. Furthermore, Heidegger's distinction between demise and death, which he does draw in being in time, intends to make clear that ontic and scientific assumptions about demise are not the primary concern at all and do not directly influence his so-called ontological investigation. What we usually call death is what Heidegger calls demise. Ontological death, as Heidegger wishes to show, is the ground for our understanding of ontic demise. Das Tür, François Das Tür, puts it as follows. If Dasein as such did not already have an inherent relation to death, Dasein could never be put in such relation by any event in the world. Kind of quote. Hence, the analysis of death is, quote from Heidegger, prior to the questions of a biology, psychology, theodicy, or theology of death. Remember that the project of being in time is fundamental ontology. Heidegger's analytic of death is, moreover, as he says, again, a quote, not a metaphysics of death, which is to say the origin of it, or whether death is a transition to another life, whether death is an evil or a blessing, and any such moral concerns are outside the scope of the analytic. This holds true. So this, even just this sentence would preclude any kind of reading that would import into this some sort of a, an edification or trying to reconcile our mortality, etc., and remain peaceful or, or ataraxia, you know, uh, um, a certain, uh, my, uh, what is it, um, mindfulness and um, tranquility about death. No, this is not what Heidegger is after. He's after the question of being. This holds true. Heidegger is a philosopher post Kant, after philosophy becomes critical and is no longer dogmatically assuming that being and thought are simply identical. This holds true then for much of the rest of the thinking path. Heidegger consequently calls the dying of others a substitute theme, because it is an ontic event in that sense. Heidegger rather wishes to arrive at the transcendental ground for such ontic occurrences. His question is thus, how can we at all relate to the dying of others and our own death? Death in the relevant sense then has to do with mortal finitude, but the story is quite complicated. In order to approach Heidegger's analytic of death, it has become a common trope within Heidegger's scholarship to compare Heidegger's, uh, Heidegger's with Epicurus' musings about death. In his letter to Miniosis, Epicurus argues that death is nothing to us. We should not worry about death, because when death is, we are not, and when we are, death is not. And Thompson also mentions this, of course, in, in Germany, it was Figal and Inga Röhm and other people who always make this comparison with Epicurus. Now, an Heidegger's analytic of death has got nothing in common with Epicurus. If anything, the proper ontologically determined phenomenon of death and being in time is a complete rebuttal of the Epicurean dictum. But Heidegger wouldn't even mention Epicurus, of course. To say that death is nothing to us in life would be a meaningless claim for Heidegger. For him, death always already determines Dasein's possibilities 
this Dasein is, as soon as it is with death and directed towards its own most possibility, which as such co-constitutes Dasein's horizon of understanding, of being, and from that very directedness, Dasein receives its meaning. If anything, then the they, das man, is stuck in an Epicurean understanding of death, but that's even, that's even taking it too far, because the they never dies, as Heidegger says. In Heideggerian terms, the Epicurean position on death is worldless, without world, because death here does not give rise to a horizon against which Dasein can meaningfully project and understand itself and the world. To be worldless is not identical, but quite close to being forgetful of being. So let me address now why, uh, first of all, why death is supposed to be Dasein's own most possibility in being in time, the eigenste Möglichkeit. Heidegger introduces death as possibility when he points out that the ordinary, quote, possibility of representation entirely fails when it comes to death. Quote from Heidegger, no one, cake the, no one can take the other's dying away from him. This indicates to Heidegger that death, quote, signifies a peculiar eigentümlich, eigentümlich, ownness is already speaking, an eigentümliche Möglichkeit von sich selbst. An eigen, so that's translated as peculiar possibility of being. Maybe a word on the word possibility, own most possibility. So I will slip back into possibility uh, in, in this lecture, but Möglichkeit in German for Heidegger does not have these echoes of posse, which means, which has to do with power, potentia, etc. But with liking, mögen, to like, to love. So the eigentümliche Möglichkeit des Seins is not a peculiar possibility of being waiting to be actualized by some other, by some peculiar being called Dasein that runs around and takes the tram. Um, no, it's, it's, there's something opening up, that's what to like means, of being itself, such that Dasein is pushed into its own here. Couldn't be further from the claim that it's some psychiatric depressive period. It's almost, it's almost as if these writings intended to deflect, to derail thought from what it has to think. Almost as if, almost as if they were working against something here that could come to the fore once we see what's actually being said. Again, death is such a way in which being opens up itself to Dasein, to the human being, that it begins to like the human being, so that the human being can come into his own, hmm? and not some peculiar depressive episode where I, I don't feel quite myself or anything like that. Death cannot be taken away from Dasein in this sense then. And if it were, then being would absolutely disappear. Death, says Heidegger, is it of an inconspicuous characteristic of everyday encounters. By the way, Heidegger says about being, das Sein, in the letter on humanism, das Sein ist das Mögliche. Being is the possible, is not the right translation. Being is the likely, that which likes. Death, says Heidegger here, is of, quote, an inconspicuous characteristic of everyday encounters. Even though only I can die in my death and no one can die in my stead, the they dictates death to be something so ordinary and irrelevant that it entirely, quote, veils its character of möglichkeit, of likeliness. The existential ontological determination of death as a möglichkeit, as likeliness, allows Heidegger to disclose the character of möglichkeit, of this liking, of Dasein most clearly, because death, is such a likeliness of being, such a liking of being, that Dasein always has to take upon itself. It's already speaking from a very different realm. It's that being, of being, of being, so that Dasein has to take something upon itself, of being. That it's delivered over from being. Yet, and this is crucial, 
qua Möglichkeit, qua likeliness, qua the liking of being that addresses the human being, death gives nothing to Dasein, to be actualized, nichts zum Verwirklichen, nichts zu aktualisieren. That is, in the Lithic of death, Heidegger here shows that Dasein is not something present at hand, but pure Möglichkeit. Death frees Dasein for its factical ontic possibilities, yes, but Heidegger determines the full existential ontological concept of death as follows. Qua end of Dasein, qua end as peras, as the limit where Dasein comes into its own. Death is the eigens, the own most non-relational, certain, and as such indefinite, in unsurpassable likeliness of Dasein. Through realizing itself, its pure likeliness, Dasein can assert itself as being fundamentally open for its most own eigentlich factical, factical possibilities of being. Once Dasein has disclosed for itself its ability to be in this way, Dasein cannot overturn or surpass this finding. As this is the full account of resoluteness, death shows itself to be Dasein's quote, from Michael Müller-Lauter, most original Möglichkeit, most original likeliness. Death determines Dasein in its ground, as Müller-Lauter says. This is in a study on, on Wirklichkeit and Möglichkeit in Heidegger, a very good book from 1960. Death does so, in fact, not despite, but because Dasein has always already turned away from it. And here we are with the thought of the simultaneity of turning away and turning towards of forgetting and unforgetting, of concealment and unconcealment. Death is thus, as Minnelato calls it, Dasein's Urmöglichkeit, the original likeliness, in which Dasein stands is death, in which Dasein is addressed by being. And now this is, there's nothing the, the imagination can fancy here. It's gone. Now we have to begin to think. Now here is the Here's the, here's the turning in thought. Even though Dasein is now fully disclosed in its being, when you read Being in Time, you're pushing against these uh, passages here, uh, being the passages of being towards death and care, etc. Heidegger reminds us that Dasein is still equi primordially, gleich ursprünglich, out of the same origin, in untruth, in der Unwahrheit. That is to say, even though Dasein has found its authentic self, so-called, this does not eradicate inauthenticity. Dasein is still open for its, this is a quote from Heidegger, open for its constant lostness, which is possible from the very ground of its own being. On my reading, that withdrawing ground is death as the Urmöglichkeit, the original likeliness, the original opening up towards being. Death here shows itself to be utterly uncontrollable, unavailable. Unavailable as a ground that would be stable in the sense of permanent and easily controllable, manageable. As such, death can, however, fully disclose Dasein's being, the activity of being, and retain Dasein's untruth, its concealedness, its inauthenticity. There are no if you like, authentic possibilities without inauthentic possibilities. Authentic possibilities do not light up by turning away from the inauthentic possibilities. Actually, the authentic way of being lights up by leaning into and seeing the authentic ways of being. Now, the, the fallenness um, and inauthenticity, those are you know, moments of untruth. Untruth also points to the simultaneous concealment in every disclosure. For that self-concealment, which is conditional on death, is Urmöglichkeit, Urlikeliness, original likeliness. Dasein's being is never quite static. Of course not. Of course not dynamic either. But it's the, the self itself is not a thing. The self is in its negation of itself, that it comes into itself. Um, so here, uh, it, it, müller Lauter argues that, however... Um, that death loses its character of original possibility, of original möglichkeit, of original likeliness, when Heidegger says that death is indefinite, because, quote from Heidegger, death is constantly certain and yet remains indefinite 
very moment as to when possibility becomes impossibility. Death becomes impossibility is what Müller-Lauter claims refutes death's original character of möglichkeit, of likeliness, since, since this temporalizes death, and since death, says Müller-Lauter, is here now apparently actualized as impossibility, in this becoming, this is what Müller-Lauter thinks. Now, however, I think that this shows rather that death is properly the Urmöglichkeit. This, you know, when possibility becomes impossibility, or rather when likeliness becomes unlikeliness, when this opening becomes the this the this opening, the unopening, the closure, because um the it there is something uh here in the sense that mm, it can only be the death can only be the original possibility when it's at once contains within itself and unfolds as both, as Möglichkeit and Unmöglichkeit, as likeliness and unlikeliness. Quote from Heidegger, Dasein exists as a throne, brought into its there, not of its own accord. Very important, not of its own accord. Hence, um, Dasein is posited, almost you could say, by 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 death. Um, but death is that that or möglichkeit, that or likeliness, that original likeliness that posits Dasein so that Dasein is already always already determined in its being by a by its not and its not yet. Omnis determinatio est negatio, says Spinoza. Every determination is a negation. I am not simply a thing that thinks it's something that is is what it is in so far as it can be negated against something else um so in this positing of the net and the not in the not yet does not happen out of a timeless sphere uh qua limit middle maintains death is outside dasein and hence outside time but i would think the opposite death qua limit is integral to Dasein, and qua likeliness, death imminently posits at Dasein. Death is only as long as Dasein is. Thus, when Heidegger says that death becomes impossibility or unlikeliness, this does not mean death loses its character of existential Urmöglichkeit, instead becoming Unmöglichkeit, non-likeliness. That means, I think, that death as Dasein's original likeliness is of an abeyance oscillating between those two, between the possible and the impossible, or the likely and the unlikely, or unfolds as such. And it's the oscillating of the grounding ground that withdraws um, from representation, ultimately, and from making available in this sense. And it's a letting go in which I find myself. This movement, and, and <clears throat> Heidegger thinks this non-dialectically, but always in the sense of equiprimordiality and simultaneity. So in this sense, he's already beyond and has moved further away from, from Hegel. This movement thus rather enforces the character of likeliness, hmm, precisely because as an existential possibility, hmm, nothing is to be actualized. To say that death becomes the unlikeliness, that death is the Likeliness of the measureless unlikeliness of existence emphasizes that the being of Daseins is never something present at hand. That Daseins being is something that withdraws from this. And precisely this becoming unlikely or non-likely or impossible to use the usual translation thus guarantees, you could almost say, Daseins analytic withdrawals from reifications. This, in turn, guarantees Dasein's freedom. Death as existential possibility must, for the law of equiprimordiality and simultaneity, contain its opposite within itself. By becoming impossibility, death shows itself as original Möglichkeit, as original likeliness, because the movement from likeliness to unlikeliness is 
only possible in so far as the original likeliness contains within itself the non-likely. That is to say, I understand the notion that the likely becomes unlikely as saying that the that which opens itself up to us and then this and then withdraws itself from us at the same time. This means to say that this fundamental swaying of opening always already and at once self-differentiates in the sense of aus und aufdifferenzieren as that which opens itself and withdraws itself. Death is hovering in this sense, is an enabling condition of all of Dasein's then truly factical possibilities. Even in average everydayness, as a quote from Heidegger, Dasein is constantly concerned with its own most non-relational and insurpassable Sein können, um, ability to be, even if only in the mode of taking care of things in a mode of untroubled indifference that opposes the most extreme possibility of its existence, end of quote. Death structures Dasein's average everydayness and thus permeates Dasein's world. That is to say, death gives rise to world as the horizon against which beings appear as beings. Miguel Bistegui puts it as follows in his book, and he wrote this book in English, or I'll quote the original, where he uses the word possibility. Death as the possibility of the impossibility of existence turned out to constitute the horizon of closeness on the basis of which the clearing of being took place. Death was the condition of possibility and impossibility of existence, the absolute limit, and the impending end out of which the world unfolded. Bearing in mind that world is ontologically the rising of being, it is death as Urmöglichkeit that brings most radically before being as the non-available presence and access of itself, thanks to which beings appear. And so what we can see here is that already in being in time, the presencing, das Anwesen, the Seinden, geschieht aus einem Entzug, occurs out of a withdrawal. More to the point, in the analytic of death, Heidegger makes the experience that being withdraws. This is where it happens. This is die Kehre, zeigt sich an. This is where the turning of Heidegger already begins. He sees what, what, how being occurs. So if we think of it as a psychiatric depressive episode, we lose everything. Everything is lost, destroyed, utterly, utterly covered over. So, der Tod unter das Ereignis, death in the Ereignis. The Ereignis is another word I won't translate. Even though Heidegger turns away from Dasein's fundamental ontology, and for reasons I won't go into here, um, death is and remains central in the thinking of the Ereignis, and especially so in contributions to philosophy and in Das Ereignis, which is Gesamtausgabe 71. And this has to do precisely with the experience that being with the, is that which withdraws. Das Sein, Heidegger now writes it with a Y, is that which comes into its own as itself conceals. And the word for this unfolding is Ereignis. That which comes into its own and that which lets beings come into their own as it withdraws. In the contributions, Heidegger writes that, quote, for us today, it remains difficult in every respect to experience the projection as Ereignis, out of the realm of Ereignen, of that which comes into its own as a refusal, as, as something that denies itself. Moreover, Heidegger says that we are in, inventively, inventively, to think forth being out of the Ereignis, out of this realm, and in this thinking hmm, is supposed to induce the transition from metaphysics to the history of being. As is always translated to science Geschichte, but history of being is not an appropriate translation, unfortunately, either. To the tidings of being, perhaps better. Now, what does it mean to think inventively out of the realm of the Ereignis? And that means also to think self concealment or absconding and disabsconding. In my view, we find in section 34 of the contributions a decisive hint at how to think the essential and how to think the Ereignis. 
The passage re reads as follows, and I'll read from the original. Das Ereignis, the Ereignis, is the self-eliciting, emittent, and self-mediating center in which all essential occurrence of the truth of being must be thought back in advance. This thinking back in advance to that center is the inventive thinking of being. And all concepts of being or all words of being must be uttered from here. How is this thinking back in advance supposed to be possible? Heidegger elsewhere says that the name of being once was the immemorial. In my view, this indicates that being is like Schelling's notion of the immemorial without presupposition and that it once could not be thought that metaphysics could not think being. Yet with the Ereignis, this has become attainable. The once immemorial, the once unprethinkable, is now thinkable. As Heidegger says, being once was the immemorial. Being is now to be thought up by thinking out of the Ereignis, that means out of that which comes into its own as itself conceals. Being is now to be thought and understood by thinking back into the original realm of the essential event. For Schelling, the incomprehensible, called a memorial, can only be made comprehensible a posteriori. And this is what Schelling's positive philosophy, um, how it avoids the abyss, really, of the unconditional, that which is unsupported. Yet for Heidegger, thinking the unprethinkable is attainable for thought in advance, not even a priori. On the face of it, this means that Heidegger's thinking he looks for the presuppositions of being and that being can be understood a priori as conditioned. But contrary to Schelling's a posteriori fixation of the immemorial, being is to remain without presupposition and unconditioned. Moreover, Heidegger does not think in terms of the metaphysical schema of a priori and a posteriori, for this schema is directed at beings. Instead, Heidegger wishes to think or to leap into the abyss and think without beings. Schelling's notion of the unprethinkable, das Unvordenkliche, wants to avoid Kant's warning from the first critique that quote from Kant, Unconditioned necessity, which we so indispensably require as the last bearer of all things, is for human reason the veritable abyss. Heidegger, however, argues, quote, from the contributions that we must, quote from Heidegger, we must take seriously Kant's reference to the abyssal. Hence we are invited to think specifically the abyssal dimension of being in terms of the self-eliciting and self-mediating center, that is the Ereignis, which is entirely unsupported and unsafeguarded. And this is what allows us to think being without presupposition, Heidegger thinks. Heidegger thus speaks of a foreboding that opens a glimpse at concealment, withdrawal, self-concealment, refusal, point to beings upgrund to the ground that withdraws that cannot be represented. Thus, with the essential, with the Ereignis as the self-eliciting center, being in its self concealment, i.e. that means in its truth, can specifically be brought into thematic focus. And death proves to be the locus of all concealment and the gateway into the abyss, or the upgrund into that which is non-available, which is what thinking still has to think. Because only from this cut, this schism, does the other side, the other light up. The leap into this thinking is a letting go of beings. In passage 34 of Contributions, Heidegger speaks also of the event as selbst ermittelnd, and that means as that which finds its own center. This is not a dialectical process, precisely because it is not directed at beings, but speaks purely of the abyss of being, where there is nothing to hold on to. That means a mitzel does not mediate for mitzel between two poles, but rather finds itself. For Heidegger, thinking is then the leaping into that middle or center, which is tantamount to being needed by being, i.e. letting go of beings, to be without beings. For the human being, this means to take, mortal, to take a mortal stance, to learn how to die before anything, Thinking is learning how to die. 
And thinking is creative, generative, generative when it lets the eigenness self-eliciting and self-mediation take their course. To think back in advance then is the leap, the abrupt letting go of everything that's familiar and leaping into the center and thinking takes on its direction and is enriched by this very center. This is the experience Heidegger apparently made in his thinking from the poverty of abyssal being, the perspective for the abundant wealth and riches of beings in their own right emerges. Proper beings arising out of themselves as they each and uniquely are. Thinking therefore is moved by the withdrawing ground of the unsupported and unsecured. Being is entirely unsupported, unsupported and unsecured. The essential event, or the Ereignis, is withdrawing, unsupported, unsafeguarded. Thus being, quote, needs those who go down into this withdrawing ground and those who are prepared to serve as the there of being as an anchor for it. That means to serve qua care, as a momentary grounding of being's truth. Taking a mortal stance is what lets human beings enter into the middle that not only self-mediates but also self-conceals in order to gain a better understanding of section 34 and the thinking of the Agnes in general. I would like to clarify what Heidegger means by concealment very briefly now. In my view, Heidegger proposes a most primordial sense of concealment which is neither occultatio nor dissimulatio both of them, occultation, dissimulation, both of them suggest something given that is covered over or distorted. Primordial concealment is precisely not concerned with beings, with something that is hidden or that dissimulates. In my view, primordial concealment is rather the utterly beingsless and non-available. So Heidegger's thinking goes down into concealment. Heidegger's thinking lets go of something that we may think of um, as something that was still held held him back um, very early on. Um, but what is it that he's trying to say? On my reading, on the most fundamental level of concealment is utter, verbergung, is utter refusal and withdrawal. Refusal, withdrawal, and concealing are uncontrollable. There's the most primordial sense of concealment occurs on the level of being. More precisely, this is how being essentially occurs, das Sein birgt. And this Bergen self-differentiates as Entbergen and Verbergen, unconcealment and concealment. This is why Heidegger says that being is lonely. Being, quote Heidegger, casts round about itself only nothingness, whose neighborhood remains the most genuine one and the most faithful guardian of the solitude. For Heidegger, abyssal thinking is always removed from beings. Hence here, he also points out that being essentially occurs in relation to beings, always only immediately, through the strife of world and earth. On the level of Dasein is the adverbial site of the grounding of being's truth. The name of concealment is being away, which mortals know from death. On the level of beings, concealment then does take on another meaning. meaning. Their concealment can be occultatio and dissimulatio, but in fact, that's not really rather that important. Heidegger here aims to think the tiding of being and negativity, carefully employed here, more radically than Hegel. Now, this is a Heidegger tries to think entirely without beings. He tries to think, in that sense, abysmally, without a ground for thinking. And this is what opens the possibility to gain a to gain insight into the simple wealth of beings again without the urge to manipulate, optimize and control them. In his notes on Hegel's negativity, Heidegger argues that absolute philosophy quote, must enclose negativity. And that basically means to take to not to take it seriously, end of quote. Regarding death in Hegel, Heidegger thus says, death quote, can never become a serious threat. No catastrophe is possible, nor is any downfall and subversion. Everything is already unconditionally secured and accommodated. End of quote. The supposedly unconditioned and independent, the self-sufficient absolute is always already secured. But what secures and supports it? The absolute, 
is always already secured by its consumption of death and negativity. The absolute needs them in order to become absolutely unified, or absolutely totalized. This thinking cannot, rather does not want to enter into the withdrawing ground. Note what Hegel says about death in the preface to his phenomenology. Death, if that is what we want to call this non-actuality. Death is non-actuality. So Hegel appreciates that death is the utterly unavoidable, purely possible, but absolute thinking immediately consumes this non-actuality and does not let this non-actuality take its course. Even though death is the most dreadful thing for Hegel, death is always, it is always already clear that death is what allows spirit to secure and fulfill itself. Death is here not an irreducible abyss, but is integrated in the total consumption of spirit. The negativity of death as absolute master serves to mediate the immediacy of positivity. Spirit fully attains itself when it strides through death and thereby makes this non-actuality less or not at all dreadful. Spirit domesticates death. As such, death cannot be the transformational moment in the sense of Seinsgeschichte that Heidegger sees in it. Hegel rather sees death as a way to ward off the withdrawing ground. Heidegger does exactly the opposite. His thinking remains in this withdrawing ground, which he had to for the situation he was in, in the unsupported, unprotected. My understanding is that Heidegger tries to think negativity more radically than Hegel in a non-dialectical way. And this is also supported from a, from a note from 1946. Heidegger says here that negativity is not to be thought dialectically as the opposite of positivity, as the opponent of positivity. Instead, the negative for Heidegger is to be thought out of being as its refusal, withdrawal and concealment. Heidegger's negative cannot be sublated. It does not negate itself. Its proper name is thus Todenon the unsupported eerie, das Schreckliche. The abyss remains abyssal, and death indicates that most fundamental being away. This is where Hegel and Heidegger part ways, or rather where Heidegger parts with the entirety of Occidental thinking, perhaps since Plato, but parts ways in the sense that he doesn't just walk over to another way of thinking, but from within this thought, he finds another path, another beginning, but it is from within this thought, which is necessarily so, uh, that it's not just a, a sharp caesura. Um, so it's, uh, this is where I should, should end. Death remains central to Heidegger for the very reason that it is death that brings us before, most radically before, the question of being, which is utterly necessary to be asked again. Thank you very much. And to be, to be repeated, of course, so thanks very much and keep well.